Welcome back to Tumor Board with Hilario and Anish. I'm your co-host, Anish. And this is Hilario. So we're very excited today to be joined by a guest, Dr. David Grew. Dr. Grew is both a practicing radiation oncologist as well as the founder of Primer, a patient-facing digital health company, which involves patient education. And we're looking forward to talking about Primer, its evolution as a platform and a business, and how to be successful and create a physician entrepreneur. So Dr. Grew, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, guys. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, so Dr. Gru, I've been following you Primer and seeing some of the real interesting stuff that you guys are putting out there. So before we get into Primer, can you tell us about how you got interested in medicine and why you decided to do a radiation oncology? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, why medicine? I really, in, right before starting college, I was, I was pretty close to going into the business school at the university where I, I went to Fordham University in the Bronx. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, Mm-hmm. That was actually my mom who talked me out of doing that. She was a <laughs> believer in doing liberal arts education, and, and the philosophy was to learn how to learn. And so mm-hmm. she knew that I kind of had one eye on medicine and another eye on business. And she said, well, why don't you, why don't you at least do the pre-med path as long as you can tolerate it? Because you could always switch over to business later. But I really right. enjoyed the sciences. I, I loved the basic sciences and just understanding things from first principles, especially physics. And that's mm-hmm. probably why part of why I went into radiation. But if you fast forward down all the way to med school on my third year rotation in internal medicine, we admitted a woman who had a new diagnosis of some kind of abdominal tumor. It turned out to be an ovarian cancer, but we didn't know what it was. And I was just really captivated by the workup of a patient who had cancer. And then as soon as we got a diagnosis, all the internal medicine guys, not to take anything away from them, but they're all high five <laughs> that they got the diagnosis. And I was like, well, what's going to happen with this lady now? Right. This is a huge problem. Mm-hmm. So I kind of followed her path, like her personal care journey into into tumor board, actually. And so mm-hmm. I just started attending the weekly tumor boards. Mm-hmm. It was that multidisciplinary team and the discussion and having input, all these doctors in one physical place at once that really drew me in. And once I I started getting into it and it was just going sort of voluntarily to tumor board every week to learn more about this collaborative oncology team, that was when I started to kind of look around the room probably like all you guys did at that stage and Mm -hmm. like, all right, well, there's a surgeon, you kind of get what the phenotype is of a surgeon and then the pathologist and the radiologist, medical oncologist. And it was was the RADONC team member that I was, I was really interested in. So then I started rotating with them and just kind of fell in love from there. That's pretty cool. So now, you, you know, you residency in radiation oncology, what specifically were you seeing in your residency that made you start thinking about the beginnings of Primer? In other words, what is Primer really trying to solve? Sure. Well, I so even before med school and then through med school, I, I kind of had a side hustle working to teach undergrads who were studying for the MCAT how to take the MCAT mm-hmm. for a company called Kaplan. I'm not sure it even exists anymore, but they were one of the bigger <laughs> test, test prep companies at that time. Mm-hmm. And it was all in person and it was like whiteboard teaching. So I just became very accustomed to taking these complex concepts and converting them into visual aids to to study, to learn concepts. And I probably did that for about a thousand hours or so from like applying to med school and then all the way through med school and stuff. Wow. And and just developed a sort of a framework and a an interest and a passion for creating simple visuals for complex mm-hmm. concepts. But then obviously once you're in residency and you're in your own practice, you're not teaching students anymore, you're teaching your own patients. And so right. What happened with the beginnings of Primer was really at the, I had always used pen and paper in the clinic, either just pulling down the exam table paper, bringing, you know, flipping over a consent form or whatever it is. 
just drawing out for patients, you know, the pelvis and here's where your cancer is. and Here's the other organs. These are going to be the risks and side effects. And I think a lot of people do this, actually. But it was during COVID where there was a no visitor policy. A lot of our elderly patients were saying, you know, can I just keep that piece of paper because I'm going to have to go home and explain all this to my kids. And I don't understand what's going on. So right. um, I had the idea in that moment to just start taking these pen and paper repetitive explanations and turn them into digital assets that we could use at mm. scale. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that was really the beginning of it. It was the, this kind of aha moment where a few patients started asking me to keep the paper, and I had a ton of time. I wasn't we were on lockdown, so it's like yeah, maybe it was time to get an iPad and a and a Yeti mic and an Apple pencil and start turning these things into digital versions. You know, gotcha. awesome. Gotcha. So it sounds like you're a visual artist yourself. You can draw, you, you, like, and you've been doing that for quite a while, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think of myself as a, a terribly good visual artist, but <laughs> the the software that I use allows for a lot of autocorrection, if you will, you know? Gotcha. Um, so gotcha. once you learn how to use the software, you don't need to be... A, a, really talented artists hmm. you just need to have kind of an idea or an understanding in, in your head of a simple way to represent something with a visual that's mm -hmm. that's the part that is tricky but once you have it in your head about what it should look like the software really does take care of or, or does the heavy lifting with making it look nice if that makes gotcha sense. gotcha so what was the name primer from then so it's meant to you know, you, you don't, we don't want to live in a dystopian world where doctors are replaced by videos and robots and things like that. So mm -hmm. uh, it's not meant to replace that in-person encounter. Like that's actually the part of medicine that we really like <laughs> is connecting with a patient personally, finding some common ground, establishing trust. That's the part of the job that we love. But what it's supposed to do is give them sort of like the basic foundational knowledge that they need, be able to at least be more comfortable in clinic, understand the basics of what the treatment is, what their cancer is, what stage it is, and what all that means for them personally, so that mm -hmm. you can just get mm -hmm. over that initial barrier of the anxiety of, of the unknown so that they have this foundational knowledge built in before they even meet me. And then when we're talking to each other, we're able to, sort of elevate the discourse, if you will, to right. more personal things. You know, they understand levels one, two, three, and four. So now we're at a level five discussion, like right out of the gate. And that allows us to connect more personally and, and allows them to have the space and the freedom to express some of their deeper mm -hmm. concerns, whether they're emotional or logistical with rides and things like that. And it allows us to be more incisive in that conversation mm -hmm. and like get right to the core of like what's what's going to be a sticking point for this patient. Because the right. overall mission is to get them to a place where they are empowered to actually do the treatment that will cure them. Right. Right. And right. a large part of that is is learning about the disease and, mm -hmm. and the treatments. And so. Right we're kind of putting that we're front loading that or preloading that. That was the word of one of the, the, the son of an elderly patient of mine. He's like, I see what you're doing here. You're preloading the education so that we can just talk about this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was a nice way to put it. I thought, because right. we're not replacing that key element. We're just putting it at the beginning. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, when I saw primer, I thought of priming patients before they come in front of you. So they know exactly what you're going to talk about. There's so much of like, at least in residents right now that you have to go through. And some of them, you could probably have your patients, you know, learn that before they get in front of you. So they can ask questions that are more, you know, incisive, like you said, and, and get, get more bang for your money when you're sitting in front of the doctor. That's it, Hilario. So the, just to get back to your original <laughs> question, I kind of went on a tangent, but I always painted houses for money growing up. And so primer is the first coat of paint right so mm -hmm. if you have like a dark wall you can't paint it another color you have to first prime it so it's like right. the first layer mm -hmm. of education so that's kind of the idea it's supposed right. to evoke like the very first coat and it's doing that in a way that's asynchronous from the physician time so it's 
it's allowing patients to learn separate from the clinic moment. Right. Mm -hmm. That's pretty neat. So I, I think it's great that, you know, again, like you said, you're kind of front loading this information, preserving that physician patient interaction and going to clinic every day. We, you know, we know how important that is, but how did you transition between making this a one clinic centered activity to then decide to reach a wide ranging audience? So, you know, how does that work? Is there a database of resources that other institutions or practices can use from your previous projects? Good question. So, yeah, I mean, I think what you're asking is sort of like, a, how do you scale this? Mm -hmm. And that is a key question. I'm not sure that I have found the perfect answer for that, but I'll tell you what <laughs> I've tried. So the first iteration of this, it's a business, is was to mm -hmm. actually commission some developers to build a web application mm -hmm. that would allow any doctor who who wanted to use the content to to log in in clinic and then just type in the cell phone number of their patient and then send the videos to them. Oh, wow. Would have them on their cell phone beforehand. Um, mm -hmm. That sounds pretty slick. I was using it myself, but, and some, and many doctors paid for access to use it, but engagement was low. And then I would go back and talk to the doctors who had paid to use it and say, you know, you paid for access to this, but I can see, you know, you're not logging in much. And they're obviously, <laughs> they're like, I'm busy in clinic. I just don't have time to log in to yet another mm -hmm. cert right. application. Like I'm in right. Epic, I'm dictating, I'm checking films, you know, like I just don't, mm -hmm. don't have time to go into this other web app. So it's like, that is great. You know, like kind of a little bit disappointing, but like learned a lot from that. Um, mm -hmm. So we tried to, to make it even simpler for them. So the next thing we tried was creating a QR code on a PDF. So it's a mm -hmm. simple PDF that I can share with you guys and you can put in the show notes if you want. Okay. Uh, but basically what it is, it's just like a one pager that has a series of thumbnails from the video library for that disease site. So for like prostate cancer, there's like nine thumbnails going from, you know, basic anatomy to radical prostatectomy, and radiation options, and how we think about PSA mm -hmm. and decipher testing and all these different kinds of things that are pretty nuanced and really important for patients to understand when, if they're going to have shared decision-making and choosing their treatment that works best for them for prostate cancer. So the whole library is listed there. And in the corner, mm -hmm. there's a QR code. So we have clinics print these out. So it's a one pager. And when a patient checks in for a consult, they mm -hmm. are given this and the MA shows them the QR code and teaches them how to scan it. And then boom, it just pops up on their phone. It's the full list of the, it's the full library there. So they can kind of surf around and, and check out these videos while they're waiting for the doctor, which usually right. takes mm -hmm. 10 or 15 minutes anyway. Right. And so they, they have a, an opportunity to do this learning in the in the very moment before they have this pretty intense conversation about selecting a treatment right. and we found that that actually works the best because patients have literally just watched the content and mm -hmm. it's very top of mind whereas when you're texting it to them or emailing it to them the day before they may watch it but they may just get the text and be like what is this or they may get the text and be like i'll watch this later on but mm -hmm. once you've got them in your clinic, they're a captive, you know, like you, right. you've got them. So mm -hmm. yeah. um, we're using that mm -hmm. moment and kind of converting the wait time, which is a poor patient experience, into a sort of a curated learning moment for that, which right. should be a good patient experience. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So even, you know, I guess optimizing the workflow, right, of physicians, the clinic, and making sure that everyone can participate. So that that's really that's a really neat idea and how you implemented that. I'm sure it's been, you know, an iterative process to get that down. You've know, got to be not afraid to try things that are not going to work. Right. You know? and then ask, <laughs> when they didn't work, ask people why they didn't work. And they'll, they'll tell you, you know, it's just right. sort of a little <laughs> bit of a blow. You spend a lot of time and money building something that people aren't using. This sucks. Mm -hmm. you know? Right. Right. Um, right. 
when you when the um, the practitioners are using your videos, you know, of course, there's that immediate patient feedback when they come into when they then are in the waiting room, they then meet the doctor and, you know, ask them about what they found on the videos. But on your end, is there any way that you assess the success of the videos and the resources? Are there any key performance indicators or anything else that you provide them? So that's being done on trial, but I'm not mm-hmm. doing that sort of at scale with the with this distributed content. When people want to use the QR code flyer, they're just free to free to use that. If mm-hmm. some institutions have wanted to co-brand it, and so mm-hmm. then there's like licensing agreements that need to happen. But I'm mm-hmm. not sure. tracking patient feedback or or anything like that with with that sort of implementation. We are mm-hmm. studying various performance indicators, patient empowerment, patient type, and patient reported confidence and things like that mm-hmm. through a, an IRB approved study at Columbia right now. And that's for women with um, breast cancer who are at risk for lymphedema. So mm-hmm. we have created content to educate them about lymphedema and how it works and, and things like that. So we're going to feed them or deliver content to them at the time of consult <clears throat> and then towards the end of treatment and then in follow up as well. And we'll be doing surveys along the way. Mm -hmm. We're not the first Mm -hmm. to do that. There was a really cool study that was done at Stanford looking at this, the similar thing. It's just, and they they were showing increased patient reported confidence, I believe was the, the, the indicator on that trial. The thing I'm kind of interested in is can you increase or improve patient reported confidence, but reduce physician time in room? Because that's, to me, it's not that we want to spend less time with our patients. It's just that we don't have enough hours in the day. Right. (laughs) So you need to keep the clinic moving. You need to find an intervention that's going to improve patient experience, but reduce time with them. Obviously, you're going to improve patient experience if you spend three hours with them at a consult. But we don't, we can't do that. Right. That, yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. And you know, aside from clinic, what I've seen is that the other use case for Primer has been clinical trials. And so how have you used and employed Primer in that setting? And what are you, you know, what are you hoping to change in how trials are conducted with, with the use of Primer? Yeah. So that all started just because I was putting all the the videos just on social media just to kind of get it out there and feedback from the hive, right? If no one's responding to it and no one's reacting to it, then that's obviously not very engaging. But if people are responding <laughs> to it, then something is, is catching their eye. And so what ended up happening was I was just putting out the content for general education about various cancer problems. And mm. the eyes started coming to me and saying, you know, this is... I like your your content, but we have this trial. It's pretty complicated. It's really hard to explain to patients in a simple way. I think visuals would help. And then they started to commission the content that was custom for their trial. So mm-hmm. that, that became sort of a, a new sort of pivot or a branch of, of the company. And, and now it's, it's keeping us quite busy, actually. There, and there's so many clinical trials open in oncology, not just for radiation, but for targeted therapies and immunotherapies as well. And so these trials are usually quite complex, but really are important, as you know, for driving the the field forward, for, for driving mm-hmm. innovation. If we can't accrue to trials, we're wasting a lot of time and money, and we're, we're slowing down the gears of progress. So Mm -hmm. I found that mission to educate patients about trials to be pretty compelling to me personally. And it also is a viable business model. So I'm really excited about building that out over the coming years. And it's not that we're dropping general education. It's just that you do need to keep the lights on somehow. So that's, that's sort of where things are going right now. Yeah, I've, I've seen a few of your videos really well done on both the ones you've posted on Twitter and your YouTube channel. And I think that's, that's a good transition 
into kind of talking about the business side of things. And our first question really is primer. How does your team look like? Is it just you? Do you have artists you employ? It's a pretty lean team. So I, I still work clinically. I've, I, I'm not interested in quitting my clinical job, but we're a private mm-hmm. practice and we're able to design our own schedules and we've decided to prioritize working four days a week. So that's been really what allows me to pursue these kinds of things. So one day a week, I'm fairly dedicated to working on the business and then also a lot in the morning. So I'll wake up pretty early before my kids wake up and then sometimes right. I'll work on it in the evening too. Um, so I'm just kind of shoehorning my involvement in and around my clinical schedule. Mm-hmm. I do mm-hmm. have an international distributed team. So I have a full-time kind of general manager, but also executive assistant. Her name's April. She works remotely. She's located in the Philippines. And then we have a variety of other vendors. So we don't have any employees, but a lot of like very trusted vendors that we've worked with for a long time. The software right. developers are in the Czech Republic. Website designer is in Ireland. Our graphics mm-hmm. designer is in Poland. We have a medical Very translator cool. who's actually a radiation oncologist who's in Spain. Um, oh, wow. Data analytics team mm-hmm. member is in the Bay Area in San Francisco. So, And then we have a Chinese interpreter in, in China. So it, it really mm-hmm. is a, a very an international team mostly of contractors. So when a new gig mm-hmm. comes in, then we kind of figure out what which team members make the most sense. And then we activate the system and kind of have standardized the process. So we're not reinventing the wheel every time. So we have standard operating procedures and protocols for how we, we manage the workflow. And it, it actually, now that the gears are turning, it, it works pretty efficiently. We usually, from the time we engage a team to create content for a new trial, until like the production is done is is usually about two weeks. The slowdown stuff is IRB, obviously. So some IRBs want to see the, the script before they see any visuals. And so then we send it off to them and then, you know, whatever, four, two to four to six or eight weeks later, they get it back to us and they're like, oh, this looks fine. And then, oh, okay, now we'll start rowing again. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's a pretty lean and pretty distributed team. Right. So, I mean, a lot of physicians obviously don't have an entrepreneurial like, experience or knowledge. And, and we've heard a little bit about how, you know, you were interested in business and you were deciding between business and medical school. But from what I, I, I know, you don't have an MBA per se, but like you seem to have a, a good sense of, you know, business. So what kind of resources did you really use to get you into this business world where you understand the, you know, the finance and like the lingo be- behind a business venture? Reading a lot. So re- read a lot <laughs> of books, continue to read a lot of books and reread the same books at different points in the journey, which is, I think, mm-hmm. is sort of an underrated tool in your, in your toolkit to, to go right. back and read a really influential book over and over and over at different points, you're going to just pick up on different things. And and it also gives you a sense of like the progress you've made personally, understanding these complex things. Listening to podcasts has been really helpful there. And then developing a network of trusted advisors would be another key. So those would be my, my top three things, but probably the most important thing is just trying and then, Uh and failing and then, learning why it didn't work and then trying again and failing. That's I think most (laughs) entrepreneurism is, is just an absolute willingness to discard any shame you feel about failure because (laughs) a thousand tiny failures, just like all day, Mm -hmm. all the time. And then, and then you make big jumps forward. And that is not how medicine works. Like we are kind of trained in designing our, our work day and our career around having almost like a zero tolerance for failure, right? right? But, but slow incremental successes that happen in like tiny, tiny steps. Entrepreneurism is the opposite. And I think that's why it's very hard to break out of the physician training mindset to embark on an entrepreneurial pursuit. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So you mentioned books and reading. If you have to recommend one book, what book would you say? I'll name a few. Um, 
well, one, I guess if I had to pick one, Zero to One is a really important book, I think. It's by Peter Thiel, who obviously is in, in the yeah. news for more political reasons, which <laughs> I'm not into, but I think the ideas in his book about what it means to build a business are really just like foundational truths that are pretty unshakable. So whether you agree with his politics or not, and I'm not even commenting on whether I do or not. <laughs> right. What he what he's writing about in business is is really pretty pretty important stuff. Mm-hmm. And and I, I just found that book to be. I recently reread that, and the second time I read it, I was like, oh wow, this is really this is pretty solid stuff. Other good books mm-hmm. that I've read, um, Crossing the Chasm, is a really important book in business because it talks about the adoption curve so it focuses on mm-hmm. early adopters or or whatever the first group is i don't think it's even early adopters it's like innovators is the innovators early, early adopters tiny, right yeah and then early adopters and then you know kind of going through the bell curve and then laggards down on the other side that's all that kind of taught me that even if you have a really great idea or whatever mm-hmm. there's very few people who are going to even consider trying to use your product that's normal and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Your job is to evolve and iterate the product. As you said, Anish, it's a lot of iteration in the process Mm -hmm. and, and slowly go through the phases of that curve and, and make it into a mainstream solution that is kind of intuitive to people. So for me, for say for clinical trials, I actually believe that every clinical trial should come with a trailer. A short video mm-hmm. trailer that's just two minutes, but uses simple visuals with lay language that even a fifth grader can understand what that trial is, the problem that it's trying to solve, you know, the key question and the gap in our knowledge in, in standard of care medicine, and what's being asked of the patient. What are they going to have to do? I just believe mm-hmm. that every trial should have that. It's not standard. There are some early adopters who've who've been able to find funding to use our service to create that kind of a little video trailer for their trial, but it's mm-hmm. not standard. Right. The mm-hmm. vast majority of trials are not doing that. So what my job is, is to communicate to my audience and to the teams that are involved in this research and the funding sources through the sponsors, how important this is that, that patients have a right to understand what these trials are about mm-hmm. in lay terms. They shouldn't be exposed to a, a 40 page informed consent document that's a legal document as like the primary source for learning about the trial. So mm-hmm. that that book was really helpful to to kind of provide a framework for where you are and where you're heading with your business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it seems just on kind of what you said and the paths you've taken that weren't exactly expected, like even this clinical trial pathway, which was only brought to you by someone else. Have there been unforeseen challenges that um, that have you know have taken a lot of your time to address? For example, even health regulations or something else that you didn't foresee. I would say less with the clinical trials. Ironically, the clinical trials has gone. It's more smoothly than expected because I don't know exactly why, but but I thought we would get more trouble from the IRB, but they're kind of green lighting mm-hmm. everything that comes through. I was kind of shocked by that. But mm-hmm. with the there's two parts. There's the content creation, which all goes to the IRB, and then there's the distribution part. The mm-hmm. distribution part is extremely hard not to crack, and I have not I've not cracked it. So the question is, okay, now we have this IRB approved content. Like, how do we need, how can we distribute this? How do we get it in every clinic that's enrolling on the trial? And how do we get the people in that clinic to actually use it? Mm-hmm. Frankly, I'm open to ideas. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> like the current mm-hmm. thing that we're doing is having the IRB approve these one pager, you know, flyers that have a QR code on them because that's sort of intuitive to patients now. They scan it and they can watch the video and stuff. But Mm -hmm. um, you need the people in the clinic to print things out and to hand them to the patients in order for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So they need to understand the value add of it. And so it's just not easy. And then 
we'd already explored using a third, you know, like a third party web application to send it to the patients as a text message, but that's a heavy lift in terms of workflow disruption for the clinical team. Mm -hmm. So, so we haven't really solved the distribution problem at all, but I'm open to ideas. I mean, I really need to just talk to customers more, basically talk to other doctors. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So adoption is, is difficult. So today, who would you say are your customers? So the people who are hiring me are usually the PIs. Okay. But the people who are paying are often the sponsors. Mm -hmm. So it kind of depends on how you define customers. But the PIs see the value of of a short video to explain their trial. The, the PIs have a lot of incentives around accruing rapidly so they can collect the data and draw some conclusions. Mm-hmm. And so they're able to effectively communicate to the people who hold the purse strings like why they should purchase this. Mm-hmm. So I guess they're kind of in different ways, sort of both customers, but mm-hmm. that's sort of, that's where we are right now. Right. As you build so, a business, you kind of always want to have one eye on, like, how can we do this at scale? And so right. currently our focus like, this year is, mm-hmm. is more engaging at the sponsor level mm-hmm. to work on, like, a whole portfolio basis. So right. working for a, a trial sponsor, they have 10 trials in a, in a clinical disease entity. And so doing more of a subscription deal or something like that with them to do all of the content for all of their trials across their portfolio. Mm-hmm. Right. So like for me, I guess I wanna, when I think about some of the use cases of primer today, one, one that seems at least obvious to me is, is that like integration or licensing your, your products into like telemedicine platforms where like even, even for some patients before they can see their doctor and, and they, they use, let's say use Teladoc, for example, or even Doximity, right? Like they, these are a platform, telemedicine platforms where you can have that integrated into your waiting room where patients who are seeing the doctor's telemedicine can also view those videos. Do you see that future in a primer at all? Yes. So we have, we, we have an NDA, so we can't, I can't talk about the details, but I am talking to mm-hmm health tech companies that are more tilted towards the clinical trial space, less Mm -hmm. like Doximity is kind of a very democratized version of that sort Mm -hmm. of platform and software. But Mm -hmm. there's a lot Mm -hmm. of software platforms that work specifically in clinical trials to decentralize trials and allow patients to engage virtually with the clinical trial team that are really interested in boosting engagement. And so they're very interested in licensing not just the custom clinical trial content, but other educational videos on like a a sort of a content library licensing basis. So that's a really nice business model because Mm -hmm. it, it's very low labor. It's very high margin. The content's already there. So it's really, you're basically just spending money to pay lawyers to manage the contracts which is not cheap, but it's (laughs) cheaper than building like a massive library of educational resources. So the answer to your question is yes, we're looking at that at just those kinds of big enterprise deals really take a long time. Mm -hmm. There's a very long sales cycle. It can be over a year before you actually close a contract, but they tend to be very Mm -hmm. sticky because once they have access to the content, patients on their platform are using it usually you're pretty locked in and that's recurring revenue on an annual basis, which is really allows you to invest in your team and, you know, you know, build out your team and scale and grow the business. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Gru, you know, you're someone who we would call a physician creator, a physician entrepreneur. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's really inspirational to us because we want to get, you know, involved more into that space as our career rises. I mean, I think historically, there hasn't been a real push for physicians to kind of be in that role. And is there any advice or resources for other students or aspiring physician creators and entrepreneurs? Yeah. I would say to start, a really key place to start is to join a community. Early Mm -hmm. on, I joined 
a community called On Deck, which is for founders. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it's it's basically a virtual incubator for mm-hmm. for aspiring founders. It's, mm-hmm. And they even have they have a variety of communities that are paid communities. I think it's a one time fee to get in, and it's expensive, but you have access to this massive network of pretty well-connected individuals. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying that's the only one. There's there's many, but it's a great place to just sort of like test the waters, interact with people. They have great learning content that's collaborative and stuff. And so I would say starting with a community and and just learning some more and then you that might spin you off into some consulting gig or something like that and then ultimately lead you to a problem i think that's a common pitfall early for people who have aspirations on entrepreneurship is you want to start with an idea but actually an idea is nothing a problem is is a business right so right. You, people will pay you to solve a problem but they won't pay you mm-hmm. for some cool idea so it's just looking and scanning all around you in in the day to day workflow of your of your clinic life for a problem. There mm-hmm. are many. So, like, light healthcare is a total mess. So, there's a lot of problems <laughs> to solve. So, just paying attention to a problem that's that's a good fit for you. It's a good fit for your right. personality. It's it's you're an expert in it, and you want to find something that you're passionate about, and it overlaps mm-hmm. with your natural skill sets. Like, what are you a natural at? So if you find something that's a real problem, that's pretty painful, you're a natural at working in that space and you have a community around you who can you can mm-hmm. draw on for experience and questions and connecting and networking and things like that. That's a great place to pl- you're 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 on a great platform to start and and jump. Right. Right. That's so true. Jeff Tangi, the CEO of Doximity said a lot of the time when like you know, these tech companies come to see doctors and try to introduce some new technology. The moment doctors start getting the sense that it's going to make their life more difficult, you already lose them. So you got to find something. <laughs> yeah, you got to find something that will make their time like more efficient or something like that. So exactly. that's very true. So, I mean, we've asked you a lot of questions about primer and, you know, medicine. Can you can you tell us what, what you do for fun? when you're not running things at Primer and working as a, a radiation oncologist? Sure, yeah. So I'm a, I'm a dad. I have four kids, so they keep me pretty busy. But <laughs> I, have, I have a ton of fun doing active stuff with the kids. We, we ski a lot in the winter, and I coach their soccer teams and stuff like that. Nice. We recently got into rock climbing together and you know, just where where you have to keep the kids engaged and active, right? right. So, far. so right. we're constantly in search of other things like that, whether it's skiing, hiking, soccer, rock climbing, things things like that. Mm-hmm. I kind of have a personal bias against that. If I'm stuck inside, I sort of lose my marbles. So, <laughs> so that, that a lot of that kind of stuff was mostly centered around the kids at this stage in life. Not a ton of leisure time, like pure leisure. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for for coming. Where where are you located and how can people contact you? I'm in Connecticut. I work at a, a Yale affiliate cancer center, but we're a, we're a private practice, but I'm in Hartford, Connecticut. And we, so I'm happy to engage with people on a variety of platforms. So email me. It's just David Grew mm-hmm. at Primer Med. You can also reach out just through our website. So we just recently completely redid the website and have all of our video resources up there for free and it kind of easy to navigate way for patients. So it's primermed.com. I also just recently bought the domain simple cancer explanations. So if you just go to oh. simplecancerexplanations.com, oh, wow. that'll redirect you to our website. Gotcha. And there's a few forms there if you want to contact us. The other way is I'm on LinkedIn and then on Twitter it's at Dr. Gru. So those would be yeah. the main ways. Yeah. If I'm happy right, to give we'll... advice or connect with people along the way if they have an interest. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank All you right. so much. All right. Cool, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right, listeners. So that was our conversation with Dr. Gru. It was very exciting to be able to sit down and, and, and kind of pick his brain on how Primer started and uh, even give us advice on starting a business. 
again, if you want to reach out to Dr. Gru, if you have some ideas or some problems to solve that Primer can fit into, we will leave Dr. Gru's like links in the show notes. You know, I really enjoyed talking to him. And I think my big takeaways, number one, was that, yes, clinical trials really do need to change. And I do think Primer can help recruit patients and also explain things much better. And I think the future of clinical trials and patient recruitment will be much more improved. And my second takeaway that I really liked was his whole evolution as just a regular physician Mm -hmm. into now a physician entrepreneur and just how he hustled and read books. So Hilario, what were your takeaways? Yeah, I mean, you know, some of the takeaways, obviously, you you mentioned how it can improve the way we we prime or recruit patients for trial. One thing, as someone who's, you know, getting an MBA, I I think one of the things that I, I feel like I got from is not being afraid to fail because like all like failing and figuring out what what doesn't work actually can help you improve on your way to creating a, a business and also you know the idea isn't to also just create you know new tech or create new new ideas and, and make things cumbersome for physicians because physicians only have so much time in the, in the day and a lot of the time we we want things that can improve patient care mm-hmm. and also help us use our time efficiently. So I, I think the way to think about business in medicine is improving on the quality of life of patients and also improving physician time, right? And I think those are the two big things that I get from talking. Yeah, so listeners, if you enjoyed this conversation... Feel free to follow us and subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter. You can also find our email in the show notes. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions, comments, and what you want to hear more. See ya.